Moi. Tota, tervetuloa takaisin. Kiva, kun olette täällä vielä. Hi. So, I'm gonna be talking about why most of you are wrong. Well, not you per se, but for some of the people who will be watching this later, um, they are for sure. Uh, this is a reality check for everybody. And why do I think I know what I'm talking about? This is a slide that every bit, everybody needs to have. So, I'm Benjamin Sarka. I'm the head of Nitzert for a bank. Whatever I say on stage from this point forward is my personal opinion, not that of my <laughs> employer, for obvious reasons. Here, I am talking as the founder of the Disobey Hacking Convention. There's my socials if you want to follow me in tweet or whatever. Anyway, here's the thing. Whenever you fly somewhere, for those of you who ever flew anywhere, people go, have a safe flight. But flights are really well regulated. Pilots have training, they have redundancies, and they have security systems that make sure that they don't come down. It's really, really safe. Cab rides to an airport aren't. Take any country where cabs aren't regulated, and you have a guy who's talking on the phone and eating his food while screaming at whoever is walking or talking or driving in front of him. And that's the guy who is going to get you killed. That's the guy who you need to be worrying about. And if you are in a position where you have to th think about risk, you have to assess where you should spend your precious security dollars or your precious security budget, you don't need to spend it on making the plane more secure. You need to figure out the basics and do, do that right. So, most of the issues in security come down to people, come down to users. And the, at the end of the day, everybody is a little bit opportunistic. When we have the chance, we abuse the system a bit, at least the people here. Uh, it's, it's, it's human nature, it's normal. We want what we can't have, and a lot of the times, the, the same is true for users. If you give them more privilege than, than they need, they will abuse that privilege, privilege. So if everybody is running everything as local admin, or everybody is running everything as domain admin, then everything gets to a point where you end up with a lot of issues, because that user will end up being the reason your entire infrastructure is compromised. But things aren't as bad as we like to think. It's not a lot of security people, and especially a lot of security vendors, are talking about how the NSA is out to get you, and how the CIA will drone strike your home, or how a foreign militia is using cyber weapons to detonate, what have you. But that's, that's not the case. That's not who we need to worry about. Not most of us, anyway. Those are a threat to some of the actors, but most of the actors have really mundane issues, have really... Uh, the se security issues aren't on the scale where they need to be worrying about governmental actors, or they need to be worried about advanced persistence threats. For sure, some of these are real threats, and for sure, this is something that you should worry about eventually. But you need to start somewhere, and that somewhere isn't trying to make your system secure from the NSA. 
That being said, the situation is pretty bad. Um, in the olden days, when I was younger, we had few targeting many. We had malware that was affecting a, a really large uh, install base. Now, nowadays, these types of malwares can be found in the Malware Museum that's curated by our uh, previous keynote speaker, Mikko Hyppanen. Uh, but today, we're actually facing stuff like memory-based network worms, where if it infects your system, you end up with a persistent network worm in your system. For, for those of you who doesn't, don't immediately understand what that means, the problem then essentially becomes, how do I turn off my entire infrastructure at the same time? How do I get to a clean state where we have a zero-day utilizing memory worm that's replicating and never leaves a trace on the file system? What are you going to do when you are in that position? We have malware of the millisecond. Every single millisecond, there's a new variant of known malware. And that's not even talking about malware that hasn't been invented yet. We have targeted payloads towards, well, most of the actors, smaller, uh, more targeted attacks. And you can all buy most of this as a service. You can get all sorts of crimeware from numerous vendors on numerous marketplaces, both in the clear web and on the dark net. And it's cheap. It's really cheap. Being an attacker is really, really easy these days. You don't need to have any technical expertise. Right. This is Robert Mueller. He's the director, or was the director for the FBI. He, like me, know that everybody gets hacked. No, nobody is safe. Everybody gets compromised at some point. If you don't, then it's not because you weren't compromised. It's because you suck at detecting it. And you really, really do. Most of us don't have a million dollar budget to buy visibility products for our network. Most of us don't even have a proper security budget so we can do proper monitoring on our perimeter. So it's really, really important to get your threat model right. If you don't, you end up spending a lot on stuff that doesn't matter. And you end up in a vicious cycle where the attackers get in, they get your stuff, and you don't even notice. That's not what any of us want, or at least not what I want. I like to keep things secure most of the time when I'm working. Here, I like to do other things in a more meaningful manner, I might ask. So what's the solution then? We need to start focusing. We need to start thinking about what, what's important, and we need to start understanding how to work in a way that actually matters, in a way where we get the most bang for our buck. We actually get something to show, return on investment. investment. So security isn't seen as a cost, but seen as an enabler for business, as something that makes sure that you stay in a business instead of taking away from the profits. Without, without it, well, we just keep doing the same thing we've been doing before. Remember the vicious cycle, right? So these are my pro tips from me to you. <laughs> you, you made agree with some of them, or you may disagree with all of them. But the most important thing to me is to detect anomalies without spending all your time on false positives. So in terms of what this has to do with hacking, you run a Nessus scan 
you get, what, 30% noise before you actually start seeing some interesting results. So you spend time on stuff that doesn't matter. You need to focus. And how do we know what actually matters? How do we know where we need to be focusing, where we need to be looking? Uh, there's a really, really cool product called a cannery. Uh, coal miners use it to stay alive. They take this yellowish bird in a cage, they put it in the coal mine, and then they wait for it to die. When thus, they need, they know that they need to get the fuck out of there, right? If they don't, then they're gonna be next. So get one of those for your system, for your network. You have something that's designed to die when something bad happens. You'll be notified and you know why it happens. You'll be able to block it. And if you can block the attack before the bad guys, whoever they may be, get your stuff, then they won't be successful in stealing your stuff. If they're not successful in stealing your stuff, then you don't have a problem. The game doesn't end in the initial breach. That's when it starts. That's when you need to start reacting. Now, a lot of people talk a lot about penetration testing. And I think penetration testing is really important. It's one of the fundamental aspects of figuring out how secure your stuff is. But for a lot of companies, penetration testing is just another checkbox. Once you have it checked off, you don't need to fix any of the issues that were uncovered. You can just go, well, it's tested, so it must be secure. That's not even close to true. As most of you know, pen tests are also very limited in scope, either because the client doesn't really want to pay for proper testing, or the client isn't really interested in figuring out the flaws in anything besides those few critical systems that they have. So when you do pen testing, when you're in a situation where you can actually order a pen test, do it with a wide enough scope so you don't need leave any of the important bits out. And if you feel like you need to leave something out because you're afraid it'll break, why do you have it online? Why do you have a system you're afraid will break anywhere in your system or anywhere in your environment? Share information. Come to gatherings like this. And talk with your peers and tell them about what you're seeing, what type of threats are happening, and do proper OSINT. Do map out everything so you know, as well as the attackers know, what's going on within your environment where, who, what, and so on. And also understand your environment. How many here work in an environment where you have one or more systems that you're not 100% sure of what they do or why they're on? How many here actually spend time figuring out what your critical data is? Yeah, so five out of 100, that's one of the issues. Another thing is that we like to blame employees. We like to go, but they click the link. They're the cause of the infection. That's his fault. He was stupid. So your employee opens, let's say it's an HR employee, opens 150 or 200 PDF documents a day because they need to look at CVs and resumes. Then the one time the attacker sends one with an attached payload, they're the one who's stupid. They've been doing what you taught them to do, what you're paying them to do, and you're punishing them because your security controls are failing. That's not how you trust your employees or how you empower your employees. Your employees are your best distributed intrusion detection system. They will figure out when something bad is going on. If your security team or if you're a security guy and everybody uh, 
a lot of security guys are like this. When, when your employees come up to you, you go, I'm busy, I'm doing something important, please go away. They'll stop reporting stuff to you. When they stop doing that, you start missing important things. It's really important to understand that the employees you have are actually the people who make sure that everything runs. So when they bring you a problem, buy them a coffee or give them a sticker or a pen. Say thanks. It was, this was really important for us. We needed this information. Then after you figured the, those parts out, do proper incident response. So how many here have an incident response team? Well, that's better than I thought, but still, it's not that common. How many of you have the capability to do incident response? And how many <laughs> of you do it on a 24-7 basis? Every time a fewer hand. So you kind of want to react to stuff, but you only want to do it during daytime because criminals also like to take breaks. They go on vacation when you go on vacation. Right. Identify what's going on before you do anything. There's in the American uh, Air Force, there's this thing called the OODA loop. It's used for dogfighting. So when two enemy or two opposing side planes from two opposing sides meet, uh, they need to observe, orient, detect, and act what's going on. And the, the plane that does it faster stays in the air. The other guy goes down. And there's some really profound truth here in terms of dogfighting and incident response. It's the closest, at least I've been able to get, to actually being human against human in the security field. You're acting against an unknown adversary. You're trying to keep everything alive. And you're trying to outsmart them. You're trying to figure out how to work in a way where you can observe what they're doing. You can orient yourself the best way to react to it. You detect changes and then you act. So you notify or you get notified that we have probably win breached. We have a system that's communicating with a known command and con uh, control server. And you know it's been going on for a couple of days or a couple of hours. Do you really think it'll matter if you observe them for a couple of hours more? If you try to isolate the host and learn as much as you can about your adversary before you actually do something about it? You probably, probably you'll get to know a lot more about your adversary if you remain calm and you'll have a better chance of actually eradicating them from your system if you observe them for a few minutes longer. Obviously, if we're talking about a system where it's really critical that they don't even get to see anything, then for sure, just block them out the second. But you should have automated controls for that anyway. Forensics takes time. Do we have any forensic people in the audience? Yeah. So how many times do you get asked, will this be ready tomorrow? When can you tell me something? Once a day, once an hour, every five minutes? It depends on the case, right? It takes a lot of time to figure out what really happened. So give your forensic team, oh, and really, you need to have a forensic team. Give your forensic team actually time to figure out what's going on before you start pestering them with stiff stuff. Train your personnel, communicate, and understand the kill chain. Now, I talked a bit about the perceived cyber threat, or about this horniness that security vendors have toward selling their devices with. This will protect you against the NSA, or 
This will protect you against state-sponsored actors. Somehow, that's become a buzzword. Somehow, we want to live in this world where we feel like we're so important that a government state actor is out to get our stuff. And in a way, that's true. Dragnet surveillance is a real thing. And we haven't had privacy for a really long time. But you should know that by now. You should have figured out that everything that's on the internet is public, even though you try to hide it. If you're not encrypting all of your communication, all of your communication is public. You wouldn't talk about stuff uh, that really matters in a public space, or you shouldn't. Like Mika said yesterday, it's really hard to buy cocaine with Bitcoin. Or so I've been told. That's the perception. We, we have this, there's this really sophisticated attacker, and that's our biggest threat. Those are the guys that really, really, really want to do bad stuff to us. The real problem is Homer here. It's not doing the basics right. It's not having proper passwords or having really poor passwords. It's not patching your systems or scanning what systems aren't patched. It's not understanding what's normal. It's not understanding what those systems you have that you don't really know while they're still on and what they're really doing, but you're afraid if you're going to turn them off, somebody's going to get mad. If somebody gets mad, then you'll at least know what that system is doing, right? So turn it off. Don't take risks because it'll make... Uh, or take the risk, don't do it because it'll make you feel uncomfortable. Do it because it'll re be really uncomfortable if one of those systems is the cause you end up being taken over. Now, a lot of people talk about segregated networks, but, and we've been talking about that in the security scene for a really long time. But I still see flat networks. I still see... Everything is talking to everything. I see everybody getting local administrative access because, well, it's just easier, or it was too hard to implement a proper user rights management system. Something being too hard should never be a consideration in security. Then I see this new trend emerging where we've started thinking that being compliant makes us secure. Now, being compliant is really important, but compliance isn't security. Compliance is compliance, right? Then we don't revalidate our access controls. So somebody gets access to a system once, and they'll have it forever. They move to a different department, they still have access to all of them the previous ones, and the longer they're in the building, the more access they end up having. The more access they end up having, the more dangerous they are. And especially if they're like Homer. We need to have good processes and protocols in place to make sure <laughs> that technology can support the users not being blamed for the controls failing. If it's a really important system, you need to have a protocol that makes sure that more than one person is involved in the decision-making process before anything happens. And sure, it adds bureaucracy, but it also leads to a situation where being a really good social engineer isn't enough to compromise your entire environment. And you need to identify your critical data, and you need to test your backups. Like, everybody takes backups. How many have tested your last week's backups? 
Yeah, that's depressing. It's five people <laughs> out of a full room. And that's really, really common. We do something and then we never test it. We never figure out whether or not it actually works and we never try to do a proper recovery drill, which is bad, by the way. So, this is probably the most important part. This is why this lecture is called OPSEC 101. Have a password, have a really long password. Have the longest possible password you can remember. And let your users have it too. And then let them use that password so they don't write it up anywhere. It'll be a lot easier to secure your systems if your users get to choose their passwords and it's a password they can remember and they don't need to change every five days. If your password is a 40 character randomly uh, generated string of words from a word list, it'll be easier for a user to remember than it'll be for a computer to crack. If your password is eight characters or 10 characters of alphanumeric crypto goodness, it'll be really hard for the user to remember, but it'll be really easy for a computer to crack. Computing power is good enough that cracking passwords is fast, even if with the added complexity. Sure, it'll be a bit harder with the special, special characters, the uppercase letters, and the numbers, but it's still the length that's most determining factor in the amount of time it'll take to guess it. So, like uh, people say on Reddit, there's an XKCD for this, but I didn't put it on the slide. Now, this is an obvious one for us here. Like, hire the white hat hackers, but don't just hire them, hire the gray hats as well, and convert the black hats to good guys and run a bug bounty program. You're not, we're not living in the 20th century anymore, we're in the 21st. It's 2017, we need to catch up. We're in one of the most technolo technologically advanced countries in the world, and we still have, what, two companies here that run public bug bounties? How is that a thing? Why is that a thing? Everything is broken. But we can fix it. Thank you. <laughs> so we have 10 minutes for questions. Thank you, Ben. Okay, first question. Hello. Can you show me the slide with the threads, common threads? Uh, did I have a slide about common well, threads? The common mistakes or something like that. That was the segregation, flat networks and so on. Yes. Oh, this, this one. one. Yes. I really like that. Those are basically uh, rather simple ideas, but really effective. Yeah. Although, one thing what I want to comment is that the, you need to keep the balance. For example, between the flat network and not understanding the normal, it might go that direction that you have. Uh, when you do lots of segregation, it gets much more complicated. And the, it's starting to eat another part of the these good points. So, uh, just one quick comment. What do you think about it? I absolutely agree, and I think uh, you should only segregate your important stuff. That's so figure out your critical data and then have that as a separate, uh, separate uh, network, and then everything else can be flat. Just don't have all the clients talking to each other. Have like a implemented endpoints or clients seldom need to talk to anything besides the server, 
So don't let clients talk to other clients. But other than that, I don't think everybody needs to be in a separate uh, virtual LAN. I don't even think, I, I mean, theoretically, you could use something like Microsoft products to create a uh, uh, dynamic uh, virtual LAN environment that's polymorphic and is based on domain name structures. And every single time an attacker comes in and scans the network, it'll see a separate network or a different network topology. It'll really slow down the attacker. It'll make it really hard to figure out what's going on. But it'll also make it really hard for you to <laughs> control it. So I completely agree with your, your point. Uh, there is this really good principle called the KISS uh, <laughs> principle. And I think that applies to security a lot as well. OK, since somebody gave me the mic, I have a question for you as well. <laughs> yes. um, what do you think about Mikko Hyppinen's remark yesterday? He said that he has become increasingly skeptical about training users. And, and since you work at a bank, I'm guessing that your users may be um, rather more difficult than the average. I, I agree in, in the sense that I don't think you should have to be an IT security specialist to be able to use systems securely but I still think that user training is really important. They need to be made aware of who they can contact when what happens and so on. So it's, I, everything's a balance, right? Security is having the right balance between usability and security. Any other questions? Don't be shy, we have time for a few more. Yes. No? OK. Then I will just remind everybody that we do have a merchandising desk. You can buy stuff to support our, <laughs> our uh, organization. And we are going to have uh, the end of the party party at Ravintola Lamba starting at 9 o'clock today after the prize ceremony. So I hope I'll see all of you there, and we can have a drink or two to talk more about this stuff and actually share some of the information that's really valuable to all of us. All right, thank you.